All righty, let's get started. So my name is Evan. Um, I work at Celestia. I mainly work on um, Celestia Core and the Celestia app. I also work on the Quantum Gravity Bridge. Um, kind of work a little bit of everywhere, but I mean, those, those are the main things. So like Celestia Core is uh, our fork of Tendermint. We had to change a few things in Tendermint if, to um, enable the things that we want to do. And um, then the Celestia app, is pretty simple. Um, it's it's like a uh, a fairly standard Cosmos SDK app. Um, as, as we'll go in further with Celestia, the um, execution environment, the state machine, the like business logic for Celestia, is as minimal as possible. Um, that's kind of the the whole feature of Celestia. But anyway, Celestia is the first modular blockchain network which I don't know if uh, you may have heard some some like discussions on Twitter about a modular blockchain. So we'll get to go over that today. Um, just like a rough table of contacts. Um, I, I want to start off with like what even modular is, how Celestia enables it, what does this actually mean for rollups, for scalability, for blockchain security, interoperability. And then at the end, I really want to try to get to the point where we can discuss like how Axelar can fit into all of this um, because that's really exciting for me. Um, so to start off, modular versus monolithic. All, all current blockchains really for uh, exist in this like monolithic architecture. So, so the first thing that all blockchains do is they, they pass around some block data that has some transactions in it. They say they, everyone, all the full nodes have to download all of this data. And they, after, after they download it, then they, they come to consensus, they order it. Somebody has to pick who, who like what, what order is, do these transactions go in? And what is, what's the like firm canonical order? When do we finalize this, all that stuff. And then on top of that, they have execution. So they actually, update a state database and and they they get the the commitment like the merkle root of that database and, and they they include that in consensus so they say they um they they literally like what our normal functionality of what we consider a blockchain to do like sending transactions and stuff they, they actually send the transaction they change the state um and Celestia actually kind of moves away from this. So, so uh, one really interesting fact, at least for me, whenever I was learning about Celestia, is that in order to be secure, you don't you don't actually need to do the execution portion. And that and this part, um, you only need to do as long as all the transactions, all the block data is available, and as long as it's ordered, as long as somebody picks. Um, the order of these transactions, then we can have a deterministic state machine, and we can we can kind of um, we don't really have to ourselves like like one blockchain doesn't have to do all of this. It can only do portions of this. It can do the data availability, and it can do the consensus, and then then the execution can be left elsewhere. So this is this is like the the common commonality between like sharding in general. It's like the um, the heaviest thing to do is the execution. So that's the bottleneck. So if we can split that up and then we can do the consensus and the data availability separately, then um, then we can, we can increase throughput at the very least. Maybe we don't scale, but we do increase throughput. And um, we're gonna talk about more of this in a little bit. So, Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. So um, if I'm correct, I think Axelar uses the Cosmos SDK, right? So um, y'all use Tendermint, same with us. Um, and we, we can, if, if I'm a malicious validator, I can actually include a invalid transaction, as many as I want, in the block and propose it, provided that I don't actually execute the, or, or, or uh, Tendermint does, sorry, Tendermint does deferred execution currently. So when, when I propose a, a block, my validator, I can include 
as many wrong transactions as I want. If, if you're running normal, honest software, it will, by default, it will not include these transactions. But if, but if I'm a malicious validator or I'm trying, I'm a wannabe malicious validator, I can include all the crap I want in there. And then, and then the, the next block, because of deferred execution, the, the next, the transactions don't actually get executed until the next block. So, so when the next block comes around, um, all the validators will go through all these transactions and they're like, that one's good, that one's good, that one's good. All of these are crap. We're not going to do anything with it. We just ignore them. So um, that's like a, a executing the transactions isn't actually needed for security. You only need to ignore as long as full nodes can ignore the bad transactions. So this is a uh, little meme. You basically just meaning that you, you don't need execution for security. Um, and this is where the modular stack comes in with Celestia. So Celestia, it kind of does what I was referring to, where it, it takes a all the transaction data for all the rollups or blockchains on Celestia, and it, it orders them. And then it also makes them available. And we'll, we'll talk about that here in a second on exactly how it makes those transactions available. And then it, um, it leaves the execution to the rollups. It doesn't do any of it. This is, this is like a key difference between Celestia and other, um, other sharded chain, or Celestia is not sharded, um, the, the rollups themselves acting as the shards. So, so like, like with rollups on Ethereum, um, or rollups on, well, they're not rollups, but parachains on Polkadot or shards on Near or things like that. All of those things have execution environments. In fact, they, 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 um, they're forced to do execution environments, which isn't necessarily bad. It's just, it's just a different trade-off. And, and, and Celestia makes the trade-off where it has no execution. It completely leaves that to all of the rollups. And we'll kind of dive into exactly how, um, how that works, um, what that means for scalability and interoperability here in a second. So let's see, execution environment still share. Yeah. So like we talked about, the only things that you need for security are consensus and data availability. And then the rest can be done by the rollups and this makes it really easy. If, if you don't have to handle consensus and you don't have to handle data availability, that what it looks like to be a rollup is you produce a block, you send the block to a Celestia node and you're done. It's like, it's, it's that easy to produce a block and to effectively run your blockchain. And then um, other people can just take your, um, other full nodes or other aggregators in your rollup or your blockchain network, they just download the blocks from all potential blocks from Celestia. And they can kind of like quickly verify which ones are the viable ones. Maybe all of them are viable. Uh, maybe only certain people are supposed to cert produce certain blocks at certain times. It's up to the rollup. Um, that's a leader selection rule. And, that, and that's basically all you need. And you have a blockchain. You have a fully functional blockchain. And then you can um, you can do the other things that you would normally do, like um, like you would need like like with a rollup you would need like fraud proofs um, with a uh, some sort of validity validity proofs for like zk rollups stuff like that. But you're 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 free to do all that because again Celestia doesn't do any execution. This is like the the meaning of the data is entirely left to the rollups. Oh, and hey. before we get to, oh, is there a question? Yeah, sorry, and I guess just to go back quickly. So, and then um, different execution environments, you have like different namespaces for them. So like, if I want to only, you know, index my, my or, um, you know, retrieve my transactions without having to parse all the data, I can do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's really easy to, you you do not have to have all of the block data for Celestia. So so like every, all the rollup blocks are kind of mixed together. They're, they're ordered and like you said by namespace and when, when you when you get that data you just ask a celestia node or 
more specifically a peer-to-peer -peer network and, and you say, um, you're like, hey, I would like the data for this namespace. And then you get the data for that namespace. And then, and then that's basically how you sync your node, how you stay up to date with the chain is every time there's a new Celestia block is you ask, you're like, hey, are there any messages? Are there any blocks in this namespace? And then the peer-to-peer -peer network will respond to give you back those, um, those block data. Um, so I'd like to define scalability really quick, just because on, on Twitter, I see it all the time. Um, people say that like a, a blockchain is scalable when what they really mean is that a, a blockchain is high throughput. Sometimes it's a little bit of both, but I, I do think it, it's very important to, to kind of distinguish the both. So like the throughput of the blockchain, whatever measurement that may be, Maybe it's transactions, maybe it's data availability, maybe it's something. And the cost to run a full node, that scalability, and that's it. Um, like a high throughput monolithic chain is really cool, but if it costs 25 grand a year to verify, then that's not as cool. That's, that's, that's starting to approach the point of where you're not verifying what's going on onto the blockchain anymore. That's that's starting to get to the point where it's it's kind of close to like Google running a server somewhere. It's like you kind of just trust them. Eh, they're gonna do the right thing. You don't actually know. They they could do not sometimes they could do certain levels of like malicious things. So anyway, scalability. How does making these modular things scale? And um, one of the uh, like we talked about before. Execution is the main bottleneck for all modern blockchains. And not only in a transaction sense, as in like, um, if we have more transactions in each block, then the state database is starts getting really big and really heavy. It starts requiring a really large computer to verify. Um, but also um, from a decentralization standpoint. So yes, it, the, like the, the larger computer it takes to verify, the larger the cost to verify the chain. So if you can make execution more efficient, then that's the only way to actually scale these things currently. And um, for, so, so you have to like do a lot of really hard work on producing the execution environment. It's a lot easier to do that work if you don't have to focus on consensus and data availability. A great example of this is like one of the co-founders of Celestia, uh, John Adler also co-founds um, Fuel. And with Fuel, that's what they do. They, they are hyper-focused on their execution environment. And because they're hyper-focused on their execution environment, they do things that you previously just could not be done. Um, like, like with Fuel V1, I think they're, they're, it's, it's only payments, but it's like, it's, some insane amount of TPS for payments because they have this super efficient UTXO model where normally like if, if everybody has to use the same one or, or then it's just like progress is slower, you can't make the changes that are only necessary for you. It's this, it sort of gets into like this big mess. Um, it's hard to even upgrade things like the EVM because so many different people rely on it. You change one thing, you break this protocol. You change a different thing, you break that protocol. So, um, Having these like highly app specific, highly optimized execution environments produces um, or, or results in scalability, like true scalability. Like the effect of like, I used to take this giant 18 wheeler truck to pull this trailer, but now it takes this Prius to pull the same trailer, which is kind of amazing. Like that's, that's actual scalability, not just high throughput. Um, Oh yeah, and then of course with Celestia, you can optimize the data availability and consensus layers. So currently we just use Tendermint because it's tried and true. Maybe in the future we try some other things. But with data availability, um, since we don't have to focus any costs or very, very small amounts of costs on execution, we can instead put those costs towards bandwidth. And more money towards bandwidth more data can be made available. You, like you have a higher throughput of data availability. So now, so now we're scaling on both ends because we're specializing, we're separating, we're making things modular and we are um, 
doing like kind of like the nitty gritty sweaty details of, of making these things actually scalable, actually optimized. Um, so, so this is another thing about like, like, um, like with a traditional huge monolithic chain, like something like what Aptos is trying to do or what Solana does, BSC, Polygon, et cetera. It's like try and sync one of those chains from scratch, from, from block height zero. It's like some of them, it can't be done because they're already running so fast. Like they're already running on like a 256, 256 gigabytes of RAM or something crazy like that. It's like, you literally can't sync from scratch. It's like, that's kind of insane. Um, but anyway, those poor little hamsters. Um, comparing different modular designs. And I guess, um, sorry, maybe one question though. Um, so as you yeah, separate like execution, right? What happens with, uh, you know, composability? Um, and, um, you know, how do you refer if you want to, you know, uh, depend on other people's data? Is it namespace? Is it an address? Uh, yeah, and, and what happens? Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. It's very interesting. There's, there's a ton of work to be done there um, for interoperability, but um, it's also very exciting. Um, again, again, uh, we'll get there, but uh, yeah, I don't want to, yeah, I'll, I'll stay focused here, but I, I will definitely answer that question later. Um, so completely separating execution for data availability and consensus allows for it. Yeah, uh, we, we basically already talked about these first two things. Um, you have more freedom in design. You can focus on the things that you want to focus on. You have more scalability potential. But the thing that we didn't talk about that I think is actually really important is sovereignty. So your chain that you build, that you put on Celestia, um, you, you can hard fork like a normal blockchain um, because you don't, you're not strictly required to have a normal like settlement layer, like, like what you would normally think of like a roll up is like with Ethereum. So like uh, on, on Ethereum, you have like, you have your roll up and you, and you have to settle on these smart contracts. And then um, if something happens, some crisis happens and you, and you have to hard fork, that's the only way around this. Um, you have to change the smart contracts. So if you change, so that means that somebody has to be in control of the smart contracts. If someone is in control of the smart contracts, then you have to have governance to it, which governance at the moment is like coin voting. Um, or you have to have like a multi-sig where the devs, you just trust the devs to do it. And what, personally, what I think would be a, a, a better model is that people choose for themselves. The users choose. The, the people who run the software, they get to pick if something is valid or not. I mean, that's the whole concept of the hard fork. So, so you can actually do that on, on, on rollups or blockchains on Celestia, where um, rollups on a platform that's settled to something that use smart contracts to settle, um, you can't. So that's kind of like a really cool feature on, on not having any execution. Um, ah, yes. So how does Celestia do this? One, one of the things that, that's really important is how do you convince a light client who doesn't, not aware of the chain, how do you convince them that the data is actually available without actually downloading all the block data? Because with previous blockchains, that's how you know that some data is available. You download all of it. <laughs> and that's obviously not scalable. You can't do that. So, so how, how do you do this? How do you do this? And, and, and um, the main things um, is basically error share encoding and sampling. So error share encoding, I don't know if anyone has um, old like me and we use, uh, have used like CDs and DVDs before. So um, oftentimes they, they get like scratched up but they still work. How does that work? Well, uh, it's like um, even if some data is corrupted on, in this case, this like disk, then um, there's there's extra copies of the data, but the copies are encoded in such a way that you only need a certain percentage of the data to be to recover the entire data. Um, so that's useful because um, if you encode the data in in a proper way, so so you you actually Erasure encode it multiple times. So with Celestia, we have three copies. We have the original data in, in like this first portion. And then, then we, we error share that. And then we, then we error share it again. 
And then we error share that again. So now we, now we have four copies. Now, the reason that we do that is because this, this effectively changes the problem. Instead of having to download all the data to make sure that 100% of it is available, we only have to sample randomly to make sure that 100% of it is available. The reason for that is, like, like I said, like I was alluding to before with error share encoding, if it error share encoding effectively makes it really difficult to hide data. Because now, now if I'm a block producer and I really want to hide um, like say one of these little squares. I really want to hide that one little square because it contains the transaction that's doing the bad thing that I don't want people to find out that I'm doing. Um, then I have to hide the rest of the, enough of the error share data as well, because if I don't hide the error share data, then you can just recreate the bad data, right? And, and, then, and then you presumably produce a fraud proof or do something like that. So, um, by 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 using like this this rather extensive error share algorithm where we are this extensive error share scheme where we we basically make the block data four times bigger than than the original data um, we we change the problem so now now it's either all of the data is available or none of the data is available and that is easy for light clients to test because they can just do a few samples. They don't have to download the entire block data. They only have to download a small portion. And, and um, this has fantastic scalability properties. It's, it's um, the, the larger the block is, you, um, it's square root of N samples um, with the block size. So that's, that's like a, a pretty damn good scalability factor. Like if you download, um, if, if the block is a gigabyte, what is that? That's a million bytes, right? Uh, can't do math, but you do the square root of that and that's like a megabyte or something. No, less than that. I don't know. I, I need to go take out a calculator. I'm sorry. But anyway, <laughs> we... So, so I guess, sorry, just a couple of questions to clarify. So as a live client, I still have to download every block. It's just that within the block, I download. No, no, no. You you download the header. So so you get the sure, header. Sure, sure. Yeah, the, I download every header though, and I within yeah. the header I download only parts of the data of the block. Yeah, you you sample just random portions of it. Okay. And 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 only only small like only a small percentage of what the actual block is. So it actually gets it gets more efficient the larger the block is. So we actually optimize for that, but we can talk about that later if we have time. Anyway. Um, the more light clients that you have sampling also means that the larger you can have larger blocks and still maintain security, still maintain data availability. Because the, the more people randomly sampling, then that means that it's even harder to hide the data because um, someone has the data out there. Like, like after I sample data, then I'm also um, potentially serving the data as well. So that means that other people can can take the data from me via a peer-to-peer -peer network, and then they can recreate the original transaction data. Um, so again, the cool thing about this is light clients convince themselves that the data is available. They don't rely on an Oracle. They don't rely on smart contracts or anything. They just say they, they, they the only way for them to know that the data is available is to sample themselves. And that enables our next thing. So trust minimize light clients. These are crazy. Um, so light clients do not have to trust. So let's just validate or set at all. That's because like they, they're doing the, the data availability sampling like that we did before. So they, they convince themselves that the data is available. And then, then they also listen for fraud proofs for Celestia. So um, we haven't implemented all the fraud proofs yet, but we, we're going to. And we have like state fraud proofs. We have fraud proofs to make sure if, if a validator encodes the, um, the error share encoding wrong. We have some other fraud proofs that I'm forgetting right now. But um, we, you, you can listen to those fraud proofs. If you receive, if the light client receives any viable fraud proof, then they just halt. Because the only way to, for any of those fraud proofs to be viable is that 
two thirds of the validators for Celestia have to be malicious. And at that point, social coordination is, is needed. Like we're gonna have to hard fork and somebody's getting their funds slashed. Um, but um, that means though, that like they don't have to trust Celestia's val validator set, which is an incredibly powerful primitive. And um, this, this is also just, important in the sense like like we were talking about how with like these large giant monolithic blockchains um if i want to have first class citizenship if i actually want to verify the data myself and i don't want to rely on you know google or some other big validator to do this for me i'd have to pay like 25 grand a year to do that well with with this scheme you could verify all the transactions that are that are important to you that are that are on celestia for like i don't know like a like a, an old cell phone or five dollars a month on digital ocean or something like that which is which is that's crazy like that that's like the the ultimate like thing that celestia enables um and and, and um we'll, we'll we'll get to this on how this actually affects interoperability and composability um, because you can do a lot of things with this powerful primitive. If if light clients can trust each other, right, then you can have trust minimized bridges. So you can get almost the same security as everything being on one big chain, except for it's not on one big chain. It's it's on many different little chains and clusters. But but we'll get to that in a second. Um, and, before and before, sorry, I guess yeah, I just want to understand, uh, and maybe it's too technical, but like how does it actually work, right? So. Okay, I'm a light client, right? Uh, I guess I download. I have to download all the data, right? So, or meaning like I have to go from the first no, no, you, you block header. Yeah, yeah, sorry, from the first block header until the last block header, right? For every block, I do the sampling to verify. Yeah. But how do and, I do state? But how do I do state transitions if I don't don't see the actual? No, data? no, you you don't you don't do state transitions. You rely on fraud proofs for that, just like you I would see. like. Like, like an optimistic rollup does for Ethereum now is just in instead of encoding that that verification logic in a smart contract, you just put it in a like you put it in your wallet. Like everyone's wallet should be a light client that th this is how we in we envision. We envision like all wallets being these sort of light clients that by default you, you should have the ability to verify these things yourself. Get at least 99% there. Like you're not gonna run a full node. That's obviously like the still like a hundred percent there is running a full node. But with 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 this scheme where you have a light client and you listen for fraud proofs, you can make an honest minority assumption. So you you only have to be connected to one single honest full node, which is if that's a very safe assumption because you I mean everyone does that already. Like like we we already if you if you're not connected to any honest full nodes, then you then you're eclipse attack, right? Then they can all lie to you, and you won't know the difference. So, um, yeah, it's it's a very very safe assumption. That's why I say like 99% versus 100. But we can keep going. Okay, so so there's a lot of crazy things you could do with this. Uh, rollups don't actually need to be a settlement layer. So that's kind of like what we were talking about before. Like instead of encoding the verification logic in a smart contract, you just encode that in the light client. And now the, the rollups, um, they're, they're effectively sovereign because it's the users who are verifying. It's the users who are selecting which software is the correct software to run. Um, which again, that's every time I talk about that, it's like blows my mind. Um, settlement layers, can be a roll up themselves. <laughs> we're, we're developing a thing called Sevmos, which is effectively like a, a limited EVM. So it's still a full, fully functioning EVM, but it acts the same way that Ethereum does with rollups now. So it, 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 it's, it's effectively like a, a settlement layer. So I, I run any rollup that runs on Ethereum now, you just put your smart contracts there, you put your data on Celestia and effectively you're done. It's like it verify, it will run those smart contracts for you and sort of act as like a go-between. So you, you still have to validate your fraud proofs or you or like or if if a, someone produces a fraud proof, they still have to go to that settlement layer and they produce the fraud proof or they play some interactive game or they post their um, their validity proofs like for Starkware, ZK Sync, et cetera. Um, it, it's 
it works just like Ethereum works, except for it's a rollup. And you can have fraud proofs for that settlement layer, for that rollup, which is kind of crazy because now, now you can have a trust minimized connection between that rollup, that settlement layer, and a different settlement layer. And so you can kind of like start having these trust minimized bridges between settlement layers, rollups, uh, any scheme that you can imagine where, where these rollups are talking to each other, the rollups that need to talk to each other the most have sort of like these, these trust minimized bridges. And, um, but, but in other places, you can't have a trust minimized bridge for everything, clearly. Um, so in that case, you could have something like XLR. Um, so this is kind of what we're getting to now with, with clusters. Um, everything on in your cluster, every, every yeah, so if, if I'm a rollup and, and I want to join a cluster, I just have to know how to verify all of their fraud proofs. And then effectively, I can have like an equivalent of IBC connection to each of them or some sort of other protocol. And if I know how to verify their fraud proofs or their validity proofs, then I'm effectively have a trust minimized bridge with them. And, and that's sort of like creating a cluster. And um, these things may end up being messy and not being as clean as in this diagram, but um, eh, the same point the same point comes across. And, and that's sort of like, um, I, I would say if, if if we have any questions on this, I would strongly encourage to um, read Mustafa's article, uh, Celestia blog post on this exact topic on clusters and trust minimized bridges for trusted bridges. Um, but yeah, I think we can probably talk about this all day for the remaining less of the time if we feel like it. Um, <laughs> so let's. So we can just talk about how like like how Axelar could fit in this because Axelar is obviously, as far as I understand, a a committee based bridge that's sort of like a hub for all of these different platforms. And I, I know y'all have a uh, bridges live on like Moonbeam and Terra and stuff like that, where previously like no one could even connect to those um, because again they're they're not like in a cluster or anything. Yeah, I'm. I'm kind of excited to talk to you all about um, where, like, where do committee-based bridges fit into all of this? Like, where, where, what's the best way to to get them involved? Um, where's like the first steps? Or what can we do in the future? Um, but yeah, I guess I can open it up to any questions too. Yeah, and I guess. Sorry, then before we get into that, uh, just to understand a little bit. So because you're then relying on the fraud proofs, right? And uh, kind of optimistic stuff, you naturally have like what higher latency between, between you know, when you can yeah, yeah, yeah. accept the finalization of transaction and things like that, right? Yeah, for fraud proofs, you definitely do. Um, you, you have to have that um, that latency because you could always still be it's more difficult, but it could be done. It could be, you could still get censored. And if you can get censored, then they can censor you for the week or whatever the time period is and boom, your funds are gone. Um, so that's that's another great point of like where Axelar can fit in. It's like with, with a lot of optimistic rollups of having like instantaneous transfers, it's like you, 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 you need some sort of committee for that to sort of like approve something ahead of time. And then maybe you also have the, like laggy bridge, the the latency, the bridge that takes a week um, to sort of like settle things ultimately in the background, you kind of have this this bridge. But for users, users would probably, I mean, most users are, <laughs> most DGENs are not going to want to wait a week. I'm speaking as being a DGEN. <laughs> so, so like things, things like Axelar are still like very, very important, especially for like, like we don't have, um, Things like like zk rollups right now, um, we're just getting started. I feel like like they're really really cool. The tech is so cool, um, but but we really we we don't have everything figured out yet um, until we get to that point where you can have those trust minimized bridges that are not as laggy. Um, but but even then, even then, um, 
like like um i think mustafa talks about this in his blog post in more detail but effectively like no matter what there's a limit to how many bridges you can have and having a hub is still really useful and even if you're connected to a hub clusters like there's a limit to the size of your cluster so you still have to bridge between clusters and things start getting really messy on like um how you verify all these things and and all of that. So I I, I still think um, I'm not trying to like um, say that uh, I don't know like committee bridges aren't as useful. They they are very very useful. Um, they they have a, like an extremely important part to play in in like the future of interoperability. Um, yeah, but yeah, I mean, does I, Axel? I, 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 I think the, the the big difference, right, between like all this optimistic and, and not stuff is that in the kind of optimistic protocols, you are relying on liveness to guarantee safety, right? And so you you know you you effectively have to say that okay, somebody tells me I'm gonna wait for this long, and somebody will tell me what I'm doing is wrong, and uh, you know if nobody tells me, I'm gonna assume it's right, right? So mm -hmm. effectively, you're assuming liveness properties off the network that you know you're not eclipsed you have good connections you know with all the nodes for a certain amount of time and then you sort of finalize things right i think the challenge comes into when you're trying to then yeah kind of a how do you finalize things sooner right uh, okay you can reduce your interval and then you assume it on much stronger liveness assumptions right <laughs> so yes, you can say like yes. i could have my interval to be you know 30 minutes but then I'm assuming there can be no downside, you know, no connection issues within 30 minutes, which we all know, like in systems, you know, <laughs> think the things do disconnect once in a while, even Facebook and, you know, everybody else. Right. And so <laughs> in those situations, you kind of, uh, you, you, you kind of do, right. So like, you have to then think carefully kind of, yeah, I guess like then the, the consensus based, right. I guess like bridges like have the property that they're instantly final and, you're not assuming on liveness to guarantee safety, right? If liveness is, is compromised, safety is preserved, right? If all the nodes go down, if they're disconnected, you know, you still have safety properties of the network. Uh, whereas in the, I guess the optimistic stuff, you, it's potentially cheaper to do things, but you are assuming liveness to guarantee safety, right? So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, so yeah, I guess like, you know, my, 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 my always thinking has been like, there's probably going to be multiple protocols and multiple ways of doing, you know, connections, right? You know, optimistic is one of them. There's like, a, you know, community base. There's like IBC, which is like light clients and so on and so forth. No matter what the, I guess, like the protocols are, right? Kind of the topology, like you describe, is still going to be, you know, surf. It's going some to be clusters, a lot. some, some, you know, uh, big hubs. It's probably right? going to be pretty, pretty messy. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> But but that's kind of what makes it fun, in my opinion. I I at least like that. But, um, yeah, it, it, I I kind of also just consider just personally. I know technically IBC is like a light client bridge, and you verify the state, and you all that you do all that. But you ultimately, I I still consider it like a uh, a committee based bridge. Like I, I I know like it does have like some additional things, but you're still ultimately trusting the validator set, yeah. which isn't that like to me. It's like I don't know, um, but but anyway. Um, I mean, but but like in the optimistic ones, you are a trust in the validator set. You just you know. Oh, <laughs> right? uh, yeah, like yeah, you, yeah. You're, you're trusting you're trusting that that an honest full node is able to send you a fraud proof, either send you directly as a light client, or post somewhere on chain like like Sevmos or Ethereum or some settlement layer. Um, there, there's some um, interesting stuff that I've heard of that I haven't really gotten a chance to take a look at yet of like um, like interactive verification games over a peer-to-peer -peer network. So I have no clue how that would actually work, but but something similar to that. Um, me meaning that that that's like one way um, around the censorship resistance issue because like peer-to-peer -peer networks are very censorship resistant and um, Whereas like blockchains aren't nearly as censorship resistant as just a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, so if you can do the fraud proof over just the peer-to-peer -peer network, then you can be a lot more confident that that you're getting the fraud proof in time, as opposed to like what we were discussing before, like like 
you can't just have it for 30 minutes because like, these things go down all the time for the, for like 30 minutes. Um, but yeah, uh, it, it's, it's really exciting. Um, I think um, there's gonna be a lot of interesting work on um, the zero knowledge stuff too, because that, that obviously doesn't rely on the liveness for, for safety. Um, but there's still a lot of work to be done there too. Um, yeah, it's just really fun. It's really exciting. We get to build all of this, guys. Isn't that fun? That's fun. Um, I don't know. Is there, is there any other questions? I have questions for Axlar, but I feel like that's kind of out of the scope of this talk. <laughs> yeah, I do have a question. Um, so with the namespaces per block, uh, could you essentially achieve the same thing by just separating the consensus into like separate um, consensus layers for each namespace? You could, but then it's kind of like having, um, but then you have to like manage all of that. And, and yeah, so, so you, you could, but I, I think at that point that kind of like breaks the, the data availability scheme for at least for Celestia. Um, and it kind of defeats the purpose of like uh, like like these uh, at least Celestia's modular stack because it's just like a lot less efficient because like um, if you have different consensus then you have different block producers and then the block producers somehow still have to all talk to each other to create the Erisher scheme in the first place so it's it's at least from an engineering perspective it's way easier just to have just just have one person do it just have the just. Uh, hold them accountable, hold them accountable. But um, just having a single block producer make a big block is like, that's doable. I can do that. I can design that, but I can't do it. But having like all these different like uh, consensus committees, like like paying attention to which data uh, should be ordered which way. Oh man, oh, that's a headache. But, a headache. So um, maybe I didn't quite understand it correctly, but um, those namespaces are completely separate, right? So there's no uh, it's, them. It's, no, no, no. They're they're all effectively in, in like one giant Merkle tree. Yeah, I, I understand it's, that, but uh, like for the execution, they're completely separate, right? So it is as if they were separate blockchains. It just so happens that could all the messages are in the same block. Um, um that's however. The rollup decides to do it. They they could um, again like the the namespace portion is just a a sort of low level thing for Celestia to to manage um, the data and serve it quickly. Um, but but a rollup depend like a rollup could like could pick multiple namespaces if they feel like it. They could pick a random one each time as long as just in their in their leader selection rule or whatever they, they kind of include is like for the next block we we're using this namespace for the next block we're using this namespace um i don't know why you'd want to do that but you could if you wanted to you could do um you could use multiple namespaces if you feel like you could like like simultaneously you can you there's there's again there's um there's no real rules to who can use which namespace Two different rollups, if you really wanted to, could use the same namespace. Um, all it is, it's it's like literally just a just an index for the data, and that's it. So does that mean that there's effectively no ground truth for what the state actually is? Actually, is and it depends on what which rollup you believe what the state is. I mean, isn't that for every blockchain? Right, but in, in most blockchains, the uh, the rollup is intertwined with the consensus and, and the state. So in this case here, as you said, you could have two different rollups that work with the same transactions in the namespace, but they yeah. could come to completely different um, uh, results with with the, the way that they execute those transactions. Right. So yeah, and their then... state might be incompatible. I, I'm failing to see how that's different from like a normal 
state transition function on a normal blockchain. I could have two different state trends. Like, like, I, like if I run Ethereum and Ethereum Classic on all the Ethereum data, then I get different results. Like, they are different. Like, having a different state transition function, I think, is, is like literally the difference between one blockchain and the next. This comes down to like, who, you know, what group of people can you get to agree to run which software to interpret the data that you see on Celestia? Yeah, it, it's, it's, Celestia has, has no rules on this. It's, it's completely determined by um, the people running the software on, on which transactions are valid, um, which are canonical, everything. Um, but, but there, but there is like, like, like you determine your own truth. Light clients themselves determine um, their own truth. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. And does it mean, I guess, like, yeah, just going back to the latency so that every application that runs then has like a, for every transaction on that application, you would have to have like this long, long latency where you're just waiting for fraud proof or so if I do like a swap, you know, on Uniswap, I then wait for like an hour for that to clear. Um, for complete finality, but there are a lot of different ways around that. Again, for, for an optimistic rollup. Um, so not, not for other types of rollups, but, but for an optimistic rollup, if I want to be entirely confident that my transaction was included in a block, um, and that the block is valid, then as a light client, if I don't want to verify everything, then I just have to wait for whatever period of time I'm comfortable with. So there's no official time on that. It could be it, like if, if you do fraud proofs over a peer-to-peer -peer network and you're very confident that you're on a, on a you, you're connected to one honest node, then you don't have to wait very long to be sure for yourself. Um, but then does that mean that you could have different state? Like, so like if there is no kind of synchronous clock, right? Like, okay, what, what do well, I like? I wait. Well, I guess I still listen for headers, and so you, you look. You use like the block sequence as the, well, as the clock. Well, I mean, so Celestia Celestia is ordering things. You 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 send your transaction to a rollup aggregator. They they perform some transaction on it, uh, or some state transition on your transaction, and they submit that block to Celestia. They tell you they're like, hey, um, I included your transaction in a block. Maybe they don't even have to do that. You can check yourself, um, but Ideally, to simplify things, they, they tell you, they're like, hey, I included your transaction in a block. You see that that block is um, included in a Celestia block. And then you make the normal assumptions that you would as a light client with an optimistic rollup. And again, like the, the validity of that blockchain of how confident you are depends on a lot of different things. Like it can depend, like, like we discussed, if I'm confident that I'm, if, if my friend is running a full node and my light client is connected to them and listening for fraud proofs to that full node, then I'm extremely confident that as soon as that block ends up on Celestia, it's final forever. Um, so it's, it's like in, in an optimistic rollup case and, and a light client, it's, it's completely dependent upon the, like the finality is, is, is sort of subjective in, in that, it's, it's however long you are comfortable with. Now, there are a lot of different things that you can do in order to, to have a more guarantee. So let's say I, I'm just a random wallet. I don't have any friends. I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not confident that I have a, a um, at least talking to one honest full node. And, and I, I submit a transaction, I get an aggregator gives me a signature telling me that my transaction was included in a block. I see in Celestia that the block was included, um, but or, or that the rollup producer produced a block, but my transaction wasn't included in that block. Then you can produce a uh, a fraud proof for that. But again, that's again this is this is all like this is all left to the people who are making rollups to determine for themselves. Um, so Evan, like, yep. you seem to suggest that the optimistic rollups and fraud proofs are kind of like inherent in the system, but um, I don't see why that needs to be the case. I mean, why can't I just have in my execution environment, my namespace, I just like 
nothing is valid unless it comes with a validity proof. And then yeah, I yeah, 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 no, no, no. yeah. I, I, okay. I, sorry, I, I must have miscommunicated there. You do not need fraud proofs. You, you can use validity proofs. You don't need anything. You can just run a normal blockchain using okay. Celestia, and and you have this sort of deferred execution model. So like like, you don't even need fraud proofs in that case. You just run a normal blockchain, but you don't handle consensus or data availability. You just run execution. Uh, we presume that most people will want to use some sort of state verification mechanism, whether that be a validity proof or an optimistic rollup. Okay, yeah. So, but if you know, if I just decide that I do not like optimism, period, and I want validity, I can do that on Celestia. I don't have to worry about yeah, it. Totally. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it gives you the same scalability benefits for both a zk rollup or an optimistic rollup. Okay. Thanks. So does Celestia store state on chain or is it completely off chain in the rollups? Completely. Oh, uh, I mean, it stores all the data, but the, the state itself, no, no state. So, so the state is completely determined by the rollups. Now, Celestia does have a, a small amount of state for, to run itself because we're just using the Cosmos SDK and Tendermint. So like we have delegations, validator sets, stuff like that. We, we have to have state for that for Celestia specific state, but um, nothing other than that. It's like a very basic chain. There's not a lot going on from the state side. It's mainly um, just ordering and making data available, but yeah. And who's running the rollups, the, the execution then? I don't know. A lot of people. <laughs> it could be anybody. Like, like, like. Um, this is this is like like in, in the case of of like let's say uh, an optimistic rollup. Um, it, it works like a normal optimistic rollup does. They they're running their side chain. Presumably, they have some aggregators. So there are some people, some important people that are like, if you have a lot of money on that optimistic rollup, maybe you run a fraud proof just to make sure, or a, a full node for that for that optimistic rollup just to make sure. Um, it's just everybody who's involved with that chain, and then and then light clients themselves, they um, they they only verify fraud proofs and data availability sampling. But so doesn't that mean that I mean as a user. I can be sure that my transaction is part of a Celestia block, but then I have to trust the rollup executors to create the correct state with that transaction. Yeah, but if they don't, like if they, if um, if, if someone can produce a valid fraud proof or um, or a validity proof, or, or sorry, it's different in this case with a, with a with a valid fraud proof, then um, then presumably there's some sort of punishment. At the very least, the chain should probably halt. But again, all of this, all of this logic is completely determined by the rollup. They could not have any punishments and just like if there's a valid fraud proof for a block, you just ignore that block. You just ignore the whole thing. Um, you don't. You don't have to. Um, you don't even have to punish people. Presumably, there will be a punishment. Like like aggregators, like currently with Ethereum, they they stick up some bond, and and if if there's a valid fraud proof, then that bond can be slashed. And and you can do that logic, but instead of having that logic in a smart contract, you have that logic either on the rollup or you can still have it on a smart contract, like Sevmos, like we were talking about earlier, where it's Ethereum but a layer two, and it's only made for settling rollups. And you can um, you can still have you can still have a, like a bond on there, and you can still get slashed um, if if you do anything wrong. Better yet, though, I, in my opinion, my personal opinion, I, I just prefer just to just ignore them, just ignore the. If someone produces a, a block with a fraud proof, and I'm a light client, and I receive a fraud proof, then I just ignore that block, and then. Um, other full nodes and even light clients potentially can they can record that um, that fraud proof with that block and then they just know and maybe they even gossip that fraud proof for that block um, in other scenarios too. I mean, again, this is this is all very 
arbitrary to the chain, like on like on a zk rollup, um, you you again you completely ignore a block. If someone produces a block with an invalid zk proof, you just ignore it. It's not valid. Like that's not canonical, and it never will be, because you didn't produce a valid zk proof. Um, Maybe I'm missing some other fraud proofs work here, but like uh, so, so because it's optimistic, like suppose a fraud proof is submitted, you know, like, like 30 minutes later, uh, and you invalidate a block, doesn't that also invalidate like potentially like state transitions that happen after that, like blocks that can yeah, different. So you 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 be starting again. Um, um, yeah, yeah, no, you're totally right on that. With with a fraud proof, if if you are late to receiving a fraud proof then um, everything that you've listened to in the meantime is, is not canonical. It's not going to end up actually being on chain. Um, but again, that's, that's something for individual execution environments to work on and to optimize. Um, it could get really interesting. But again, um, as a light client, you still only have to rely on being connected to one honest full node. And then, and then like, What's the maximum amount of time that any message can propagate through a peer-to-peer -peer network? And if you wait, whatever that time is, usually I think uh, in general it's like a few minutes, like five minutes. If you if you wait five minutes, and you are confident that you're connected to at least one honest full node, then you're fine. Um, then, then, then um, the scenario where you wait 30 minutes won't happen. Um, it will only happen. It will happen sooner than that. But again, yeah, it, it's still problematic, and it's not instant, and it still doesn't get around the fact that you are relying upon liveness for safety with an optimistic rollup. But I mean, uh, yeah, it's completely determined by the rollup itself. So uh, I uh, still think that I'm missing something here. If the state is not anchored in any way in the blocks of the, the Celestia blocks, then... Well, I mean, the commitment to the state is... Oh, okay. Yeah. That's like the like with the roll-up, the, the, the roll-up roll is just a normal blockchain. So it, it just has potentially some state verification mechanism, but it also has like a commitment to that state in the header of the block that it posts. And that's how it gets slashed too. Like okay. all, all fraud proofs and whatnot depend on that commitment. So that means every rollup that runs on the Celestia chain has to have a commitment in, in the block? It's up to the rollups. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to keep saying that. I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> presumably, Thanks. presumably, yes. Um, but but you can, if you wanted to, like, like we, we've thought about having... Um, like what would a blockchain look like that doesn't have state fraud proofs or any state at all? Like, like literally it's just a set of transactions and, and that's it. That's all it is. It's just order transactions. And in order to recreate the state, you just, you, you have to run a full node yourself and, and you don't, there's, there is no such thing as fraud proofs or anything. Like, like you just run every single transaction for that blockchain and then you come up with the state at the end. Maybe you have some, if you trust somebody, you can do some state sync or something, but um, you could do that too. Like, like you don't technically need a commitment, um, but you probably will have one, eh, probably. Like, like it limits you if you don't. Um, awesome. Yeah, yeah no, so, so sounds great. I, I think this is super interesting, right? And I think it's interesting to see how, yeah, kind of a different, I guess, protocols would, merge i think right uh not merge but to interact with one another right because i mean i do think there's going to be you know like optimistic stuff is going to stay there you know instant finality stuff uh is probably there and like they all have like you know some of them have different needs and use cases right and uh it's uh we'll have to merge them at the same time so <laughs> it'll be quite interesting yeah i mean i think it is it's incredibly exciting to be a blockchain developer we all are very lucky just because there's so much cool things going on and it's so new. And um, there's like all these crazy designs that you can come up with that have never been possible before. And now with like a modular blockchain stack, it's just like a more powerful tool for um, blockchain developers to do crazy and crazier things. Um, but before we before we leave, um, do was 
is Axler is the Axler team going to be at like any conferences in the future? Um, yeah, I think I kind of want to meet you guys in person now and talk with you. Sounds like you guys have a lot of really good questions. Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, we, I think some of us are going to be at Avalanche Summit next week. Um, and then I think we'll participate in Paris Blockchain Week. Um, I think MIT Bitcoin. Is it the, like ETHCC? Is that Paris Block or Paris Blockchain Week? I'll, I'll figure it out. Um, yes. ETHCC is in, uh, in June, but we're applying for that as well. So we'll be at nice. uh, Paris Blockchain Week next month. We're also going to be uh, at MIT Bitcoin Expo. Okay. Um, cool. And we're going to be at Consensus as well. That's kind of the big one nice. in, uh, in Austin. All righty. Well, cool. Well, I hope I will see you at at least one of those. I don't know if I'll go to, um, I think I might go to ECC. I don't know. Someone from Celestia will probably be at all of them. So you, awesome. you'll at least be able to um, ask more questions there. But um, thanks for having me here. I hope to meet you all in person sometime. I hope that we get to... Um, have more questions and I hope we get to collaborate in the future more. For Yay sure. for Axlar committee based bridges. It's gonna be crazy. Um, anyway, I'll stop awesome. sharing my screen now. Thanks, Evan. I think this was super interesting. And yeah, thanks for walking us through this and answering the questions. I appreciate it. My pleasure, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Goodbye. Thanks. Hey. Thanks, Evan. Bye. Thanks.